Good morning. I want to welcome everybody this morning. Uh, first, first order of business. I'd like to ask everybody to turn your cell phones off so they won't ring. Out of respect for our speaker who came down from Chicago last night to speak to us. So let's not have our phone ringing. I want to thank the uh, National Association of Realtors in Chicago for sending our speaker to us today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Andrew Bushnell, who's the North Carolina Association of Realtors CEO. She helped to arrange this for us. And I want to thank all of you for coming. I've spoke to people who are here from Asheville, from Franklin, the uh, Smokies, Great Smokies, Carolina Smokies, uh, Board of Realtors, Northeast Georgia, our own people, a lot of different uh, banks that we visited. They're represented here to hear about the economics of our business. So I want to thank you, Toby, for coming. And hopefully you'll leave here feeling very blessed that you can. Uh, at the end, we will have a couple of question and answers. Uh, if you have a question, just kind of hold that thought. And at the end, we will uh, bring the microphone and, and answer your questions. Uh, our speaker is Lawrence Un. And I guess most of you have read most of his profile. He oversees and is responsible for uh, the existing home sales statistics for the National Association of Realtors. He writes an article in the National Association of Realtor magazine every month. Uh, he does the buyer-seller profiles. Uh, he's, he's a pretty important guy out there in Washington and Chicago. Uh, I'm not, uh, let's see, Dr. Young's NAR forecast partic participates in economic forecasting panels, among them the Blue Chip Council and the Harvard University Industrial Economic Council. He appears regularly on financial news outlets, frequently speaks at real estate conferences throughout the U.S. and has testified before Congress. Dr. Un appears often as a guest on C-SPAN Washington Journal and is a regular guest columnist on Forbes' website. Um, has his degree from Purdue and from Maryland at College Park, it's PhD. So with that, let's welcome Dr. Un, and as he speaks to us, Please be attentive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, President Randy, uh, for the uh, introduction. Um, this is my first time visit to this uh, corner of the country. Um, and I was just checking out the downtown, uh, and uh, Randy uh, noticed someone who was wearing a tie, and he said, this is unusual, so I have to stop by, and, and he explained more about this area. Uh, I explained uh, that uh, given the unique location, you know, sometimes geography, you know, North Carolina is a very wide state, uh, and this is the corner of the, uh, North Carolina. Uh, uh, which football team do people around here root for? <laughs> uh, and I didn't get a direct answer. You know, the Tennessee Volunteers, uh, Georgia Bulldogs, uh, Carolina oh. fans, uh, the Crimson Tigers, I guess that you agree. And also, uh, I grew up in South Carolina, and you know, it just somewhat freaks me out that I came from, uh, drove from Atlanta uh, to North Carolina just without even touching South. Uh, Carolina. Um, uh, my parents uh, had worked at the textile factory for several years, and I know that in Murphy uh, region, uh, it has been a very important textile factory region before uh, the, uh, all the jobs uh, were uh, shut down. Uh, but now uh, it has become a more second home, vacation home uh, destination. Uh, Asheville uh, certainly is doing very well uh, as a vacation home uh, market retirement community. Uh, so what is in store here? I mean, Atlanta is bursting at the seams, and anyone can uh, uh, experience that just from the traffic jam uh, of it, but that, that is indicating that the job market is super strong. Uh, maybe people are looking for weekend retreat, um, and uh, surprisingly, uh, when I spoke with several of you, that you indicated that it's not actually people from Atlanta who are interested in buying some vacation home here. Uh, it's people from Florida and, uh, and more distant uh, location where they are uh, looking for. But uh, let me explain uh, how I see the market uh, developing, um, and also uh, 
for realtor community, uh, you would have gotten an email notice or if you have signed up for text messaging, a uh, text messaging to say there is an important call to action. Uh, that is to say that uh, if there is an issue that is impactful for real estate that people in Washington may try to apply, uh, we want to notify you. Uh, given the over 1 million realtor members across the country from all uh, spectrum of uh, economic, you know, their personal life, uh, we don't expect everyone to agree uh, with the position that NAR has taken, but NAR takes a position we, we think that it is uh, impactful for real estate. Um, and the committee of the realtors were involved actively uh, which, uh, you know, through the discussion, come out with NAR policy. And we do have some concern about the tax reform bill that came out of the House of Representatives. The Senate will soon come out, I believe tomorrow, with their version of the bill. Uh, there will certainly be some amendments to it, uh, and then uh, they will go into conference. Uh, and if there is an agreement, uh, and they have sufficient number of votes, uh, then uh, the legislation will pass both chamber of the Congress, House of Representatives and Senate, and once that happens, uh, the, you would go to President's desk, President Trump signs it, and it becomes the law of the land. Uh, and they want to move this very quickly before Thanksgiving, uh, which means that there is a less chance for ordinary American, in my view, uh, to digest fully. Uh, but uh, the goal of tax simplification, I think we should cheer that. Everyone is tired of April 15, the hundreds and thousands of pages. Uh, so tax simplification and, and, and uh, reduction in taxes, I think that's something everyone should be favoring it. Uh, but as related to real estate, we are very concerned. So let me uh, first start with that. And um, see if I can go into the slide uh, mode. So I think people won't in the back. I'm not sure where I need to put the clicker pointer. Oh, I need to turn it off. They said to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tax reform. So what is included in the tax reform? So mortgage interest deduction, which we know has been vital and it's been in place in the U.S. tax code for hundreds of hundreds of years, uh, technically does not get touched. So your elected official can say, we are not touching mortgage interest deduction. So at least they are adhering to a expression that realtor community have always expressed, don't mess with mortgage interest deduction. But the role of mortgage interest deduction greatly gets diminished under the current proposal, which I will go into. Property tax deduction, they will limit it to only 10,000. I know that many of you are well below that 10,000 uh, limit. So it doesn't impact uh, you as much, uh, but say, uh, and then the 1031 exchange for commercial practitioners, uh, this is very important. Uh, we have relayed, I thought 1031 could be very vulnerable during the tax reform, but the, under the proposal, 1031 exchange for real estate is in place, meaning that if you're commercial practitioners, uh, you should, yes, uh, you know, I'm glad uh, that is uh, in place. 1031 exchange for non-real estate, things like aircraft leasing and all of that, uh, it will no longer be available. So uh, the realtor community, real estate community has lobbied hard, so they recognize the importance of 1031 in real estate, so that's in place. The current proposal is unlike the 1986 tax reform. When the 1986 tax reform occurred, uh, there was some negative consequence short term for the real estate, but the economy was doing very well. One can say that because of the tax reform, it provided the stimulus for the economy. And this is what uh, the uh, people in Washington who are pushing the tax reform are saying, that yes, some industry will be impacted, but the economic growth, better job creation will compensate for any negative that one may feel from the uh, real estate market. Back in 1986, it was the case where you had a a very high income uh, individual, whether a medical doctor, lawyer, or other business owner, uh, who said, I have high income, how can I reduce tax? And their tax advisor essentially said, buy real estate. 
uh, and you can get all the real estate depreciation and other passive losses. Uh, but that was no longer permitted under 1986 tax reform. So the demand for real estate just fell off from those high income individuals because they could no longer uh, get that tax deduction. If you are a real estate professional, on your tax form you indicate, I'm a real estate professional, I work, uh, I forget how many hours in the real estate industry and so forth. So if you buy real estate property, then you can get that depreciation, but not for medical doctors or not for uh, lawyers. So that's uh, how the reform. So what is our concern of current proposal? It greatly raises the standard deduction. And the philosophy behind the standard deduction is the following. People who are earning their first sets of dollars should be tax-free. First $1,000 of people's income should be tax-free. First $2,000. First, $12,000 under the current law for family is tax-free. So first $12,000 you earn, you get to deduct $12,000, so your taxable income will be zero. Now, Social Security tax are a little different. Uh, you can base the tax rate immediately from your first uh, dollar. But for income tax, uh, current law say first $12,000 will be tax-free. After that, you face the tax rates. Under the new proposal, it is no longer 12,000, it is 24,000. So now, first $24,000 of family income would be tax-free. So many of you are saying, oh, that's pretty good. I get a larger tax cut than before, or I don't face the tax rate. The reason why NAR is concerned about this is that it diminishes the role of the mortgage interest deduction. We have always said that mortgage interest deduction is there to at least stimulate, push people to say, other things equal, you may want to consider buying a home. Now what happens is that for renters who are clear beneficiary of this higher standard deduction, say, look, I'm a winner. Now I don't have to own a property, I get more tax. So when we do the analysis, the renters are clear winners. Homeowners, some are winners, some are losers. Uh, people with large families, uh, you lose personal exemption. So bringing additional child into the family, you no longer get that personal exemption. They mentioned something about tax credit, but those are very small amount. So generally, larger size family, you bring additional child into the family, you don't get that personal exemption. Um, and, and consequently, uh, when we do the analysis, we are finding that on average, homeowners actually would pay higher taxes. Uh, not every homeowner, but on average, homeowners would pay slightly higher taxes while the renters clearly benefit. And that is our overall concern of the uh, tax reform. And that's why we put call to action. And you don't have to necessarily agree with us. Uh, and you know, everyone has an uh, individual uh, view about politics. But if you believe that, uh, that uh, not having that additional push to buy, uh, to become homeowners, uh, the role of mortgage interest deduction, uh, then uh, you would respond to call for action and, and then say to your elected official to say, look, tax reform is a laudable goal, something we want, but why are you trying to hurt real estate? You know, this is, is in essence you are trying to express, uh, and we set up a system for people who are more newcomer where you just click a couple of buttons where, uh, and you put your address and a letter under your signature would go to your elected member of Congress to say, uh, please don't hurt real estate. I mean, we understand the importance of the tax reform, but don't hurt uh, real estate. Other aspect of the real estate, second home, mortgages, no longer available. Second home, property tax deduction, no longer available. Second home, capital gains, tax exemption. When you sell a home, you can have a capital gains. Currently, most of it is tax-free, so uh, unless it's greatly uh, above uh, half a million dollars for a family. But for second home sales, no longer uh, taxable uh, capital gains immediately. So second home market immediately gets whacked uh, under this uh, proposal. So, um, so we are trying to relay the information that yes, some of the second home, I understand that they are trying to target the wealthy, some of the uh, homes are in the oceanfront properties, but uh, recognize not all second homes. I mean, the median price of a second home purchase, the pension home purchase actually is the same as the primary home. So these are not built for or million dollar homes, 
uh, but these are weekend retreats. In fact, mo there is a high concentration of second home in Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, people want to go hunting on weekends, people want to go fishing on weekends uh, for, for auto workers and others, and it would hurt the second home market under the proposal. So because of all this, uh, we are expressing concern to say, you know, let's change it, uh, modify it, so the real estate would not get uh, hurt from it. So uh, that would be more concise explanation of the overall tax proposal. Again, we want simplification. Uh, you know, the, the uh, reduction in tax rates, uh, but at the same time, you know, why are you, in essence, benefiting renters, and, and, at, this, and at least financially, he's not providing any incentive to become homeowners. So the renters will stay renting uh, for a longer period. And just for illustrative purposes, I put this uh, pie chart. So you can see that the red part is the taxable income, what the government will tax uh, from it. And the green and that little uh, diagonal shape, the uh, crossbars, those would be deductions. So under the current one, which is on the left side, you see that uh, the green would be the real estate deductions, property tax, mortgage interest deduction. But what happened under the new proposal would be that standard deduction gets enlarged while the real estate deduction gets shrunk uh, automatically. So real estate tax preferences will play much less of a role than before. Now let's go to the market conditions. So tax reform, again, uh, we hope they modify it because under the current proposal, uh, it looks to be uh, more hurting the home ownership uh, opportunities and while benefiting the rental uh, community. So regarding the overall market condition is that housing market has steadily come back. So from year uh, 2010, you can see from the very early point, it rose, and there's a slight fluctuation, but overall it's staying at the elevated level. And in the most recent quarter, the third quarter, the red bar, uh, one uh, step slower than what it had been going before. Uh, but so no uh, major changes in momentum. It remains elevated uh, quite strong. Uh, and the forecast for this year is that home sales will actually be somewhat higher compared to last year. So red bars 2017 and 2018, which I will go into the explanation why I believe uh, that we will be higher, assuming that tax reform does not hurt real estate. So whatever tax reform they do through amendments and alterations, hopefully uh, they don't hurt real estate. So assuming that uh, the mortgage interest deduction continue to play an important role, and I anticipate home sales will be higher in 2018. One thing to note here is that uh, if you look at 2005, so that would be the peak in home sales, we are no, we're near that level. So anyone who is saying, well, isn't home prices in Atlanta rising a little too fast, and Nashville is rising a little too fast, and Charlotte rising a little too fast, it has certain feel of a bubble, because any home that comes onto the market up here is getting picked up within a month, you know, the days on the market is 30 days or even less in some very heated neighborhoods. So it has a feel of a bubble, but this chart is showing that home sales are nowhere close to what it had been. And we know the underlying fundamentals. 10 years ago, 2005, uh, easy subprime lending condition. Today, mortgage underwriting standard is exceptionally tight. Anyone with fluctuating income, especially the realtors and others with commission income that is fluctuating, almost impossible to obtain mortgage, even though your average income may be consistently high, but if it's fluctuating, the lenders don't want that fluctuating income. So the underwriting standard today is much, much tighter compared to back then. And the other thing is, uh, back in 2005, there was an overbuilding. Uh, everyone wanted to be home builders, and they oversupplied. Today, uh, we just don't have enough inventory. Home builders are not back into the market, um, and as a result, the supply situation is much different today compared to 10 years ago during the bubble. So it does have that feel of a bubble, multiple bidding in some neighborhood, uh, less inventory, a fast-moving pace updates on the market, uh, yet uh, it is not a bubble condition in my view because the underlying fundamentals of easy lending is not there, overproduction is not there. Let's look at, uh, zoom in on the more recent years. So what I'm doing here is just looking at more recent years on home sales, which is overall uh, increasing except for two occurrences. 
One was 2009 and 2010. Uh, that was the time period uh, when there was a temporary home buyer tax credit. Uh, in the nearby state, in the state of Georgia, Senator Isaacson has been a major friend for the real estate industry, and naturally because he's from the real estate. Uh, and working with Senator Isaacson, uh, we were able to pass a home buyer tax credit back in 2008. What was the home buyer tax credit? That was when the foreclosures were rising, no one was buying real estate. So uh, speaking with the Senator Isaacson and many other congressional uh, staff and members of Congress to say that let's stop the bleeding in housing. There are some people with stable job that they don't want to go into the market because they don't want to buy a depreciating asset. So how do we stabilize the market for those people with stable jobs? Why don't we put $8,000 on the table? $8,000 home buyer tax credit. This is different from mortgage interest deduction. You buy a home and you get $8,000. So, so that was the short-term stimulus measure. Um, and uh, it did exactly what it was intended for. And many people with stable jobs came into the market, picked up that $8,000 by buying a property, and it stabilized the market. And then housing no longer uh, bled. The prices began to stabilize and then the jobs began to be created. And once jobs started to be created, uh, we said, well, we no longer need a temporary uh, tax credit. And consequently, uh, you probably don't see it on the chart on my monitor. Uh, you see that once that home buyer tax credit went away, there was a modest decline in home sales. But job creation was now supporting the home sales. Uh, and then you go to 2013 and 2014, another occurrence of modest uh, reduction in home sales. What happened there? For people who were in the industry at that time, it was a time period when mortgage rates jumped from 3.5% to 4.5% overnight. So your consumer, who thought they had 3.5%, suddenly are shocked the next day to say 4.5% mortgage, forget it, I'm not gonna buy a home. So there was a sudden increase in mortgage rate uh, that held back the sales. Why did the mortgage rate increase suddenly, I mean essentially overnight? Uh, it was from chairman of the Federal Reserve at that time, Ben Bernanke, uh, who made an off-the-cuff comment. And one of the reporters asked the question, how long are you going to uh, print money? Uh, because the Federal Reserve was pursuing something called a quantitative easing policy. It's so just a little different word, which in reality is nothing more than printing money. They were printing a lot of money. And Ben Bernanke replied, Surely, printing of the money cannot continue forever. So as soon as he made that remark, interest rate jumped from 3.5% to 4.5%, and that shocked some of the buyers and they, and they left to the pool back. 2016 was a good, decent year. Some people will say it was a great year. You go to Rally Triangle region, uh, Charlotte market, uh, people will say it was a, a, a great year. 2017, there was a possibility maybe home sales would decline in 2017. I already mentioned 2017, we are likely to see higher home sales overall uh, based on all the numbers I have seen. Uh, but there was some concern that going into 2017, early part of this year, the sales could be modestly lower. Why? Because of similar phenomena in mortgage rates. So the first circle is Ben Bernanke comment, which is known as the taper tantrum. We're not gonna print money forever. So that comment boosts the interest rate. Then, but then it started to go down again. Then it began to rise suddenly again on the second circle. What was that second circle about? It was the surprise election of President Trump, the election night. So when going into the election, everyone thought that the election was pretty much set. Then when President Trump uh, looks like he was going to win Electoral College, the bond market began to react, and then the uh, next day uh, after the election, mortgage rates went up from 3.5% to 4.3%. Uh, maybe not exactly like the four, you know, Ben Bernanke, but something similar, mortgage rates suddenly increased. Why would the mortgage rate rise from the surprise election of President Trump? Well, there are confluence of factors. First, some people may say, well, President Trump is pro-business, and if it's pro-business, the economy will do well, and if the economy does well, we don't need this artificial low interest rate environment anymore. So we are just normalizing. So some people may have viewed it that way. Other people may have viewed, well, President Trump had campaigned on 
building the wall, upgrading the highway, spending more on the military, and you combine all that with a big tax cut. So more government spending, big tax cut, means larger budget deficit into the future. And if you have to borrow more, or the government has to borrow more, surely it's going to pressure interest rates to rise. Just like if you, as an individual, have to borrow more money, the bank will say, look, I cannot charge you with low interest rate. I have to charge you slightly higher because you are borrowing more and more. Uh, so, uh, so that could be the case. What happened uh, in the reality? Well, no one knows for sure because the bond market is determined globally. You have the German pension fund, uh, Chinese government, a mom and pop investor, Wall Street companies, all buying and selling bonds. So all that interaction led to higher uh, mortgage rates. So because of the similar phenomena and sudden increase in mortgage rates, there was a reasonable expectation maybe in 2017 home sales could modestly drop because of the higher interest rate, just like Ben Bernanke several uh, uh, years ago when the interest rate rose from the quantitative easing uh, remark. But what happened is that after the election, home sales, December versus December of the year before, were higher. January higher, February higher. Every single month all the way to August were higher compared to the year before. We have the September data out, but it's not included here uh, because I had to submit the PowerPoint before that. But September figures were just modestly lower compared to the September of the year before. Uh, but essentially every month it was higher. Newly constructed home sales, similar story, higher home sales and new home sales, except for the most recent couple of months where it was uh, modestly uh, lower. So mostly throughout 2017, home sales were running higher. Why could this be? NAR takes survey of consumers across the country, asking many things about real estate, including a very simple question, is it a good time to buy? And that vertical line shows the election time. So compared to before election versus post election, there are more people who are indicating, yes, it is better time to buy. So mortgage rates are higher, yet people are saying it is a good time to buy. More people are expressing good time to buy. Stock market, on the election night, the futures market was down about 500 points. And people were afraid what's gonna happen the next day. Well, the next day stock market opened and stock market actually closed higher. And then higher after that, the next day, and what do you know, we are just still trying to see when we will hit this uh, high mark. So the stock market just continued to increase. Animal spirit. Animal spirit is not a biological term. It is an economic term that was uh, mentioned by John Maynard Keynes, who says psychology can impact the economy. If people feel good, people will go out and spend more. And if they spend more, companies will have to hire more people, and those people who now have jobs go out and spend more positive multiplier impact. And one can also view it negatively. People are afraid that people don't spend, and companies lay off workers because they don't have customers, and then it goes into downward spiral. You know, you know, just like FDR said, uh, the worst thing, that, you know, we have nothing to fear but fear itself this invisible entity out there that, that can really wreck the economy. So psychology can have an impact, both positive and negative, uh, to the economy. And what happened after the election, this consumer confidence index, which uh, this company has been measuring this figure for over uh, 60, 70 years. After the election, consumers are saying, yeah, I feel better about the economic prospect than before. Business community. Yeah, they're saying, yes, I feel better about the prospect. You turn on a cable TV news TV network at night, and you know how, you, how polarized the country is. No one can dispute the divided country nature. But on average, at least related to economic dimension, people are saying they feel better, or their prospect outlook looks better. Uh, so the mood is a little better. Stock market is certainly you know, way up there. Um, so uh, that maybe this is the reason as to why the housing home sales activity throughout 2017 was higher compared to 2016 last year, even though initially there was a higher uh, interest rate environment. Median prices also continue to rise. I mean, there's some little seasonality with winter home prices being a little lower than summer home prices. Uh, and this is lower not because of price decline, but different types of homes are sold. Generally during spring and summer, larger size homes get sold because families 
with school age children, they buy larger size homes, so the median prices are higher in spring and summer. Uh, but in winter months, you see generally a single people purchase property, generally smaller size homes. So you see a little seasonality, but general trend has been prices are on the upward path. Uh, and it is on the upward path because we don't have inventory, even in rural areas of the country. In the past, when there was an inventory shortage, it was all about California and New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., coastal phenomena. Today, it is a nationwide phenomenon of not having inventory. Asheville, North Carolina, if they have more inventory, they can sell more homes. Um, Atlanta, more inventory, they can sell more homes. Uh, Charlotte, same situation. So all through middle of America, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Louisville, uh, you name it, Nashville. I mean, they just don't have any inventory over in Nashville. Nashville is booming. Um, so it is occurring, uh, impacting everywhere, including Murphy. Uh, President Randy related to me that uh, the inventory situation here, even though the job is not job market is not necessarily pretty, uh, the inventory is drying up. So if there was a more inventory, then there could be more excitement to purchase, whether vacation home purchase by say Atlanta resident who want to buy a uh, lake property. Uh, but there's just not enough inventory uh, uh, nationwide. Month supply is very tight, and that's why prices are rising. Um, and also, the, many of the existing homeowners are not putting up their property onto the market. In the past, people lived in their home for about six years, generally younger families. Six years, they purchase, stay in their home for six years, maybe school district they're looking for, or they have additional child, so they need that additional bedroom. So after six years, they want to trade up. Today, people are staying in their home for 10 years, not six years. So people staying in their home for a longer period uh, than before. The inventory shortage is a direct consequence of multiple years of builders underproducing. The red line is how much single family home construction we are doing in the country. Blue is 50 year average. So we have been under 50 year average for the past 10 years. And this constant Accumulation, I, I should say, a non-accumulation of housing starts over the past decade is the reason why there is this inventory shortage nationwide, uh, just not enough inventory. Um, and why don't we have enough inventory? Uh, one can pinpoint towards two things. Uh, one is the construction loans has become much more difficult. As part of the financial regulation 10 years ago, uh, known as Dodd-Frank regulation, uh, many of the community banks, local banks, say this regulation means I have to hire two or three more people. Not two or three loan officers, but two or three compliance officers. Just pure money that, that is set aside not for the business purposes, but to meet Washington regulation. And furthermore, because of the regulation, they don't know if they can make those construction loans. So if they do, Washington examiners want to look at your books. So the many of the community bankers are saying, look, heck with that. I will make less loans than before, less construction loans. So because of that, many mom and pop home builders are struggling to get their construction loans now than before. Big home, big builders, Lennar, Toll Brothers, uh, they don't need community banks. They just go to Wall Street to get money. So you, the building activity that you see are many big builders, but it's the small mom and pop builders who have been shut out of the game. So big builders are in the game, small uh, builders struggling to get back into the game. The second reason is construction workers. Even though a nation is committed, we are creating jobs, the construction jobs are still below what it was, and, and many builders are saying, even if they can get those construction loans, they are having a hard time finding construction workers. I'm glad I'm speaking here at the uh, Tri-County uh, Community College, because I think many of the community college can play a greater role into the future about bringing workers with trade skills rather than book skills. There are too many people perhaps going to the university just reading just books after books and books, uh, not with the real skills of, say, electrician, uh, plumbing, uh, and, and other uh, things that is needed. And we need more carpentry, wood framers, uh, and, and other construction-related work. Uh, but right now, we are well short of the construction work. And furthermore, 
it is well known, but something that we don't want to discuss publicly, uh, is that at construction sites, there are many illegal immigrant undocumented workers. Um, and with the border tighter, or rhetoric becoming much more, you know, uh, that is more difficult to draw uh, 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 people into construction. I mean, I wish there's more domestic legal workers going into construction because it pays good middle income salaries. Uh, and there was a one survey done, I think this was to college students, again, not the community college, but universities. They said, if construction work offered you six-figure salary, $100,000, would you go into construction? And the university students responded, 95% said, no, I'm not going to go into it. So there is this difficulty of drawing people, even in that hypothetical example, of course, construction workers are not getting paid six-figure salary unless they work you know, really overtime, overtime, overtime hours. Uh, but even in a hypothetical situation, people believe that that the physically laborious work uh, they want to shy away from. They want you know, the office work, even though there's a critical need for construction workers. And because we are not able to get domestic workers, uh, many of the companies are relying on undocumented illegal immigrant workers uh, at the moment. So uh, how do we boost the construction workers? I think the trade uh, community colleges can play a critical role into the future uh, in that sense. Um, and, um, and you know, these are good uh, uh, paying uh, jobs. In fact, if you think about it, all of our great-grandparents uh, worked in very physically demanding jobs, whether farming, uh, other occupations, even at factories, you know, eight hours just constantly uh, uh, doing things. And if you ask them, was the job interesting, they will say, no, not necessarily, it was not that interesting, but they all have pride in their job. And what was that pride about? They were breadwinners. They could help out the family. You know, that was the spirit as to why they did it. Uh, but today, the hypothetical six-figure income, and people are saying, no, I don't want to go into that uh, construction. Uh, so, and, and, and someone has to wonder, uh, you know, how can we change some of the spirit that as to people where there is a critical need in terms of getting these workers uh, into construction. Prices are rising. Um, but the affordability is becoming less because prices are uh, rising. Uh, and even in a low interest rate environment, many people have purchased their property many years ago at 7%, uh, 8% uh, interest rate. Today, the interest rates are 4%. Historically affordable, but prices are now beginning to rise fast, so becoming uh, less affordable. Uh, and this is a nationwide chart, maybe not the Murphy area. Income growth in the past six years has been that income grew 15%, while home values have grown by 48%, so mismatch. And this could continue uh, if we don't have more inventory, more home construction that, that comes onto the market. Um, and people, uh, when asked uh, about the affordability condition, first the purple chart that shows the current homeowners. For current homeowners, is it difficult to save for down payment? And very few are indicating difficult to save for down payment because you, if you are homeowners, you are using your housing equity as your down payment for your next purchase. So if you're homeowners, you are saying down payment is not really a problem. But for first time buyers, they are saying more and more are indicating saving up for down payment is becoming difficult because prices have risen uh, too fast. Uh, and uh, just a uh, uh, call to action, again, the tax reform, I think we have a concern about uh, so if you do call to action, uh, all the information uh, about home buyer, what they are looking for, home sellers, what they are looking for is over 100 pages long, many bar charts, graph charts that you want to look at. Uh, it's freely available, so you can download it for free, but you have to do call to action uh, to get that report. So housing market uh, is recovering in terms of rising home sales, rising home prices. But home ownership rate is uh, stuck at a 50-year low. And do we want home ownership rate continue to remain at 50-year low with renters now getting tax benefit, but no incentive to purchase a home because mortgage interest deduction is no longer at a play. Um, so home ownership rates is low, but is it the case because the people believe that renting is fine? But when we ask the question, is owning a home part of your American dream, solid 80% of Americans believe that it is part of the American dream. Uh, while 85% still want to purchase a property at some point in the future. 
So there is a mismatch between aspiration, this desire, uh, and the actual realization. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the, the, so people are indicating that American dream, what is American dream? Well, I want my children to do well. Uh, and also people are saying, I want to have a real estate of my own. And, you know, that's what people are indicating as what uh, part of the American dream. Look at the, uh, let's look at the wealth comparison. Wealth of a home renters is about $5,000. Everything they have minus everything they owe. On average, renters have $5,000. So automobile is on one asset, you know, they can sell it, it's how much asset, asset $5,000. For homeowners, it's substantially larger and it's rising. So red is 2016, blue is year 2000, so it's rising. So over the long haul, owners do well. So we want to encourage more home ownership, successful home ownership, not the easy subprime lending, successful home ownership, but the tax law may not kill people that way. And many homeowners will say, look, when I become homeowner, they're not consciously trying to uh, I mean, they are looking to build wealth, but every time they make that mortgage payment, subconsciously they are building wealth. So they're paying down part of their principal. And if the prices rise, those are all pure bonuses they are accumulating. While the renters, you know, they, they are just, just paying someone else's mortgage uh, and someone else's uh, wealth. Uh, home ownership rate very low. And we, one of the reasons why they are low is that student debt. Student debt is impacting many areas, including not starting a business and not purchasing a reduction, reduction in vacation. But the number one item they're cutting back is on purchase of a purchase of a home. So student debt has tripled in the past 10 years. Triple. Student debt is triple. And university students, again, they are saying they don't want to go into construction, even, even in hypothetical $100,000 uh, year income. Um, and I think you know, one has to consider how do we get more people into trade skills, like community colleges. So because we want people to be very well, and if they are four-year bound college, we want uh, success from them. But we also see many people who go to college and drop out. And if they drop out, they have large student debt. They don't know how to handle it. Maybe the community colleges can play that big role in that adjustment to get that Again, the, the skills that we need immediately, electricians, lumber framers, uh, the uh, plumbing, welding, uh, uh, car mechanics, and uh, everything. So student debt is a major issue, and by the way, the tax reform says this. Employers, there are some employers who offer college tuition assistance. You go to college, and we will pay some of that education costs. Under the tax reform, that goes away. So employers will no longer have an incentive to offer that because they can no longer deduct that on their tax bill, uh, which uh, means that uh, that student debt overhang on home buying will become an even bigger issue going into the future. In the meantime, uh, Federal Reserve has started to raise interest rates. It has not impacted mortgage rates as of much yet, uh, but surely it will do so. Um, and because uh, they are raising interest rates, the people are wondering uh, if there's uh, some bubbles out there that is ready to pop. Um, and uh, stock market, some people are indicating, well, this huge increase in stock market, maybe it is better economic prospect, but it could also be partly a bubble. At least some people are indicating from easy money policy. Federal Reserve has printed too much money. If you want to save money in the bank, it offers you nothing. So you are chasing after something, and one of the something is stock market. Uh, and the stock market P-E ratio, that graph, one sees is moving. Anytime you see that peak, what happened was that there was a stock market crash afterwards. Uh, now it's beginning to rise. Is that the recent increase in price earnings ratio uh, justifiable, or is it partly bubble from the easy monetary policy, and now the Federal Reserve is beginning to raise interest rate that could pop in the future? Uh, it's hard to say. No one can really know whether or not there is a bubble. Um, and people are indicating maybe there's other bubbles in the gold, bond market, commercial real estate, uh, residential real estate, uh, even Bitcoin. People are saying people are buying Bitcoin not for any other reason other than they think prices will rise. You know, that's the only reason why they are buying. Uh, they are looking for uh, somebody who is a uh, fool, fool enough uh, to buy a Bitcoin at such a high prices because there's no fundamental behind it other than the fact that uh, people think it will rise. 
So there is some concern, but on the U.S. real estate, I would say there is no bubble, at least regarding U.S. residential real estate. Because home sales today are 30% lower, and also builders are not building 53% lower in terms of housing stocks. So residential market, really no bubble, other than if there's a tax legislation that greatly harm real estate, then you can see a pullback among buyers, especially vacation uh, home buyers. Um, and, and let me actually skip that part um, and go to the economy. Um, economy is overall doing well, and in fact, you may actually say it is quite impressive. President Trump said, I want to be president because U.S. economy sh should be growing at 3%. Under prior presidents, President Obama, President Bush, the economy was struggling to get to 2%. In the second quarter, it was 3%. In the third quarter, it was 3%. And the third quarter is quite impressive in light of the fact there was a hurricane in Houston and Florida market where it led to pause in business activity. So even after accounting for those hurricane impacts, the economy still grew at 3%. So those were quite impressive. But what's going to happen going forward? Um, and you know whether tax reform will boost the GDP growth further. Uh, I would argue uh, 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 on the opposite side that if you harm real estate, you will actually drag the real estate downward. And if the real estate goes downward, GDP will go downward. Uh, but so far, the economy has been doing quite uh, impressively. But residential real estate investment, which is home building activity, is actually negative. So if the residential investment activity is positive, GDP growth could be even 4%. And if you get a 4% GDP growth, I mean, you, you are looking at, it solves many of the problems. You know, the budget deficit gets shrunk, um, and fast job creation, wages rising very fast. So if we can get the home builders back up, uh, that will solve many, many of the problems. Job growth, very positive nationwide. And this is the job for three nearby states. And uh, the red will be Tennessee. Uh, interestingly, Georgia and North Carolina, they're uh, step by step all together, just going uh, through. Job growth in all these three states are much faster than national average. So at least in the major cities, big cities of uh, Nashville, Atlanta, Charlotte, Raleigh, they are doing exceptionally well. Rural areas more slower in recovery in overall job conditions. And this is the overall jobs in the Cherokee County. Uh, I guess there's little seasonality, but compared to year 2010 versus now, uh, one is looking at maybe about 800,000, I mean 800 net new job creation, 800 more jobs now than before. Uh, and unemployment rate in Cherokee County went like this, from 16% uh, to now uh, about 4%. Uh, but the 4% unemployment tight labor market, but the construction workers are not there uh, regarding the workers. Total job openings remain sky high, indicating there's no recession over the horizon. And companies are not firing workers, so unemployment insurance claim remains very low. Very good indicator about economic prospect going forward, that no economic recession over the horizon over the next year. Um, so the forecast is that no recession. Uh, this year, uh, year as a whole, maybe about 2.2%. You know, second quarter was good, third quarter was good, but first quarter was below 1%. So you would average that out, so it's not going to be 3% of, of GDP growth. But 2018 could be something close to 3%, assuming real estate is not harmed. Uh, and if the builders start building, it could be even 4%. I mean, tremendous opportunity on GDP growth uh, if the real estate, especially home construction, can be revived. Um, inflation will begin to slowly pick up. So people who are on Social Security check, you know you've got no cost of living adjustment past few years. Next year, 2%. Year after that, maybe even 3% cost of living adjustment because inflation is beginning to pop out. Related to housing, uh, assuming that tax reform uh, gets modified so it doesn't harm real estate, uh, whatever builders feel, they can sell it. So I think the new home sales will rise. Existing home sales uh, this year will be better than last year, and I think next year will be even better than this year uh, because of the solid economic condition. We just need more inventory, and as the builders build more, we will have more inventory and that will lead to increase home sales. Uh, prices, no bubble, it will continue to rise. 
Uh, I know people are from northern Georgia, Atlanta suburbs, all that. You know, the prices will continue to rise because there is a this huge swings uh, that, and it has this wave phenomenon. So prices rise in one city, it begins to just uh, that you know, you just like you throw a rock in a pond and you see the wave going. So the price increases just goes on and on and on. So I think uh, the price increases. Uh, will be rising uh, next year, but the mortgage rate will be somewhat higher. So just to remind your potential buyers that longer they wait, mortgage rate could be uh, modestly higher. Nothing alarming, you know, four and a half percent for 2018. So local housing forecast uh, is uh, based on my conversation with Randy is really about home building. Get more inventory into the market. I know you are also short on rental inventory, apartment buildings or single family rentals because uh, some workers just cannot find housing. So it's about building both single family as well as multifamily uh, construction. We have a housing shortage. My final slide uh, is on President Trump's uh, uh, presidency as related to real estate. Uh, thank you also for people who responded a couple of months ago on flood insurance. <laughs> Uh, many areas of the country, uh, Louisiana, um, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Florida, and other places, uh, from time to time they get hit with flood. Uh, some areas of North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, they get hit with flood. If it is considered a property is in a flood zone, which is not a perfect mapping situation, it's just a guess, if they say it is in a flood zone, one has to have flood insurance, otherwise you cannot get a mortgage. And if you cannot get a mortgage, you cannot make that sale on that property. So it was set to expire in September. So we put a call to action to say, no, we cannot have flood insurance expire, then all the homes in the flood zone will not get transacted. Uh, so let's extend it. So they extend it to December, but uh, it's going to expire in December again, so we may have to do call to action again. Uh, so even though you may not experience or you may say flood insurance is not an important issue, uh, by the fact that you respond that really helps carry, you are helping out other realtors in other parts of the country, clearly a real estate issue. Um, the Dodd-Frank, uh, President Trump has said he wants to undo Dodd-Frank, uh, so I think uh, by doing so, he will help some of the local mom and pop home builders to get that construction loan to start building, so I think that's positive. Related to the Wall Street companies, I think those are debatable as to whether Dodd-Frank is good for Wall Street companies, but what but Dodd-Frank is clearly bad for community lenders. Uh, it's been a big, uh, 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 onerous regulation. Fannie and Freddie, uh, this would be 2018 issue. Let me just quickly say that NAR committee has said Fannie and Freddie or equivalent is important. Without government guarantee of mortgages, many of your clients cannot obtain mortgage. Whether you are getting the mortgage from Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or Community Bank, they're lending those mortgages knowing that they can sell it to Fannie and Freddie. If there is no Fannie and Freddie, they will be hesitant, hesitant to make those mortgages. Uh, NAR said that Fannie and Freddie is important, but that will be 2018 issue. Um, and uh, we'll see how that plays out because there are some people in Washington who said let's abolish Fannie and Freddie. Uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, in the past made a huge mistake. All those bad managers are fired. They're only concerned with helping homeowners uh, using the government guarantee. And the way to view it is when you go to a bank, you see an FDIC uh, guarantee window. So money you put in the bank, you know, you, independent of whether the bank goes bankrupt or not, you know your money is safe. Well, we view it similarly as to Fannie and Freddie role, that even in a financial crisis, mortgages will still be available. Um, our commercial practitioners, by the way, by, by show of hands, how many are you uh, in commercial real estate? Okay, just uh, two or three of you. But during the financial crisis of 10 years ago, there was nothing available for commercial mortgages uh, because there's no government backing of the commercial uh, mortgages. So if it happens on the residential side, mortgages uh, will be much more difficult to access, especially during the financial turbulent times. Uh, tax simplification, I already went to it. Again, we want tax simplification, but in a way, it doesn't harm real estate. And as currently written, the early draft, uh, we think that it will be harmful for uh, real estate. So I have spoken a lot. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for listening. I think there is still pent-up demand 
Atlanta market is just rolling along well, Charlotte market is doing well, uh, Nashville, Knoxville, Chattanooga, all doing well, Asheville, I'm hearing, uh, doing well. Everything trickles down. So, you know, if people are doing well in Charlotte, maybe they want to have a, a lake home uh, nearby. Uh, Florida market is uh, doing well. So I think you are set for a good recovery in the local region uh, as long as you let the momentum and the economy carry the day. Uh, if the tax reform, let's make sure it is done in the right way. Uh, but if it's done in the wrong way, where you cannot get mortgage interest deduction or tax preference on second home, I mean, that will be a completely uh, different picture. So uh, thank you very much. And I think I can take a few questions. Too. So thank you very much. Yes, if you've got a question. Microphone to you. Good afternoon. Thanks again for coming out. Quick question. What is the theory behind the tax plan? Why would they attack these these issues like this? I mean, are they saying everybody's got to give up something? I mean, what's the theorem? I mean, your argument made perfect sense, but why didn't they go the other way? Um, so the goal of the uh, tax reform uh, is to say that, well, let's try to remove the loopholes. And by uh, removing the loopholes, we can simplify it. Um, now, from an air perspective, we say home ownership is not a loophole, it's a public benefit. But, uh, so, but uh, now I'm gonna express my own personal opinion, not an AR policy position. I don't know why they're raising the standard deduction from 12,000 to 24,000. Now some people say when you go to church, everyone pays tithe, you know, 10%. In theory, you know, people may pay a little less, but everyone pays something. So, so, so some people believe that well, uh, why are we enlarging the number of non-taxpayers by raising the standards? You are greatly enlarging the number of non-taxpayers uh, in the process. So my own preference would be don't raise the standard deduction. Keep it as is. And if you keep it as is, that means mortgage interest deduction still plays that critical role. Uh, so that will be a better situation. And by also not raising the standard deduction. That means the taxable income remains larger rather than your shrinking. Because, uh, so that would be my own opinion uh, of it. Uh, uh, but the idea behind raising the standard deduction is you get rid of all the loophole. To simplify it, we're going to just raise the standard deduction so more people don't have to worry about all these other parts. So, so that's the behind it. And I think what we are trying to say to Washington uh, is by raising the standard deduction, you are diminishing the role of the uh, the real estate tax preference. Related to the second home, Washington thinking is, well, those are only for the wealthy. Uh, but we are showing the graph on the Wisconsin, Michigan. Look, these are hunting lodges. This is our fishing uh, a place where people will just want to have to do a little fishing over the weekend. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, we are trying to illustrate uh, that second home is not all for the uh, wealthy. In this area, um, hurricanes affect Florida. Caribbean in a huge way, and I'm just curious if NAR has done any kind of microeconomic studies of, of um, that kind of thing. Well, natural disasters are, uh, it's been around <laughs> since the beginning of time, and natural disasters occur. Uh, and every place that has been hit with natural disaster, or even human disaster, uh, September 11th event, it has recovered. Somehow there's a human resiliency. And uh, in also America, because of much uh, you know, wealthiest country in the world, uh, strong building code. So if there's a flood in Bangladesh, you see tens of thousands of people die. But even with this huge hurricane that hit Florida, uh, the casualties are in the single digits. I mean, these are amazing building code uh, that so the increase well. So, Natural disasters lead to pause in business activity. There's a recovery period. Uh, and every place that has been hit with natural disaster, they all recover. Only exception was New Orleans Hurricane Katrina. There was a permanent displacement of many people, and people who did not want to return. So there's, in New Orleans today, there's 50,000 fewer jobs today compared to pre-Katrina. So that was the one area where you did not fully recover. And I think the Puerto Rico would be something similar to Katrina impact, where you see many 
uh, people from Puerto Rico that are going to New York City area or Orlando where there are many family members, uh, and I think that could be more of a permanent move. So, but in general, uh, natural disaster, that's part of life, I guess, uh, you know, it's a, a tragedy, and, uh, but it occurs, uh, but uh, somehow every community recovers uh, from that. One final question for anything. I got a question. Yes. You, you had said that uh, in your bio that you speak before Congress, uh, and when you and I were talking downtown this morning, you said you were going to go to Washington. Are you going to Washington to speak to Congress before this tax reform as far as the NAR position? Is that the purpose of your trip? Or uh, so first, uh, people in Congress recognize the uh, importance uh, of real estate. Um, and then your member of Congress will say something like this. As soon as you say something, you would, the first response he or she will say, look, we are not touching mortgage interest deduction other than for second homes. The mortgage interest deduction is there. We're just raising the standard deduction. Now, your response should be, well, by raising the standard deduction, it diminishes the role of mortgage interest deduction. So that would be your counter argument. Uh, related to the congressional testimony, um, if there is a very specific economic related issues, uh, I do testify, but if it's a real estate issue, uh, we want actual realtors to testify. Of course, we provide all the data, uh, but you know, I speak constantly with the congressional staff. Uh, so as part of trying to digest all this tax early draft bills, Senate, I believe, will come out tomorrow. So I need to be in Washington for all, all, all the uh, part. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, we want realtors to actually testify, and the realtors who have recently testified has done very well, uh, because uh, one of the things uh, about realtors is that uh, it brings, uh, every community has realtors. Uh, and if a, a politician wants to get a pulse of what's the deal, talk to a realtor. They will tell you why people are moving in, why people are moving out, or why they're not buying home. Uh, and we always constantly mention uh, that. So if they talk to an industry, you know, steel maker, it's very isolated, uh, you know, coal mining, uh, but the realtors are throughout the country and, and we want to put that human based community uh, and the realtors have done very well. But I need to be in Washington to do all the background numbers uh, work for that. You mentioned a minute ago on the tax reform and I don't know if we clarified it, that on the second home purchase, which is the bulk of our income in this room, is that the capital gains rates are going to go away when they sell so is their gains going to be taxed on income levels is that what they're proposing or what are they saying on gains on those second home sales um, so capital gains i mean technically it will be capital gains and so you'll be capital gains tax rate uh, which will be i think they are reducing capital gains tax rate uh, to uniform uh, i forget 20 percent or something so you will be at that level um, the other thing is, even on primary residence, as is proposed, again, this is our draft, they're trying to do amendments and all the changes. Uh, even on primary residence, it's currently two out of five years. You know, you are a primary resident two out of five years, then you get a capital gains exemption uh, part. They want to change that to five out of eight, which means that uh, if you are a homeowner, you are staying put for longer, even though you may want to change uh, residents, you know, additional child in the family, but now for tax purposes, uh, one will be staying put longer period to avoid the capital gains, even on primary residents. So uh, currently it's two out of five years, but now the, the proposal is five out of eight years, uh, which again, to, for me, I want America to be mobile uh, society. You, you want to say people are moving up, moving up, moving up. You don't want to say people stay put, stay put, stay put. You don't want to say that. But this will, in essence, say stay put for a longer period. So they're going to make it a universal gain rate, and second homes are going to be subject to that, not to income tax levels. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, I cannot definitively uh, say, but that will be the, I mean, if, if it's capital gains, there's a separate capital gains uh, tax rate, yes. Anybody else? Okay, with that, I want to thank you again for coming from Chicago to speak to us. Good luck in Washington. Uh, I want to thank each of you for coming. I think it's been very informative. Hopefully it'll give you some encouragement to uh, tell people that there's not going to be a bubble in residential real estate, that we have a shortage. And uh, hopefully it's been good for you. Thank you.